Our scripture this morning comes from the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Later, God's angel spoke to Philip. At noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. He got up and went, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia, where he was the minister in charge of all finances of Candace, queen of Ethiopia. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. So running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He answered, how can I without your help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. The passage he was reading was this. As a sheep led to slaughter and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial, but who now can count his kin since he has been taken from the earth? The eunuch said, tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Philip grabbed the chance, using this passage as his text, and he preached Jesus to him. As they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. The eunuch said, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water and Philip baptized him on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of God suddenly took Philip off. And that was the last the eunuch saw of him. But he didn't mind. He had what he had come for and went down on the road as happy as he could be. Now, good morning again. I want to start with just some thank yous. I want to thank all the members who took time to sit down with me and have conversation, honest, vulnerable conversation. I was incredibly blessed and so grateful to hear stories that I knew, but so many stories that I didn't know. Um, I was moved. Um, I don't know if there's anything I do on a daily basis that's more important than having conversations. Uh, with others. Um, it was very special and I hope it's special for you this morning as well. Now this is going to be the shortest sermon of my life uh, because I want to get back to their experiences. Um, but I wanted to ground uh, our uh, work, work today in scripture. We all know the scriptures that are used to condemn us. If you lie with a man you're an abomination. Thank you Leviticus. The women and men turned themselves over to lustful desires, turning what was nat away from what was natural to what is unnatural. Thank you, Romans. <laughs> but in today's scripture, we have such an in-your-face, flabbergastingly obvious story of acceptance and tolerance. I remain baffled that so many Christians want to exclude us from the body of Christ. We have a eunuch. A eunuch considered by Jewish law as sexually other. Outside the binary. Even though he has place within the Ethiopian court for a first century Jew or Christian would have been considered suspect, odd, curious, deviant, queer by any definition you really want to use. And he's riding along in his chariot. Philip jumps in and he wants some understanding of the scripture and what does Philip do? Doesn't question who he is. Doesn't question his background. Doesn't say that there's anything wrong with him. Doesn't look uh, for some psychological trauma that may have made him made the way he is. Doesn't love the sinner but hate the sin. What does he do? He welcomes him in his fullness and completeness through baptism into the Christian community. No questions asked. Wow, what a story of diversity, equity, and inclusion. <laughs> now, I'd like to turn to more of the experiences of our members. Well, I grew, I'm old, <laughs> so when I was growing up, I never heard that word. In fact, when I was 18 and in love with a woman, 
I went to the library and looked up the word lesbian because I had never heard it. And when I read that word in the dictionary, I thought, oh yeah, that's me. Um, I knew that I was gay probably in high school. I just, there was this one teacher in high school that I just was drawn to and I just thought, why am I so confused about why I like this woman? I mean, it was like, I was, it's, it, it was bordering almost on obsession with her, you know, I just. I think I've known this for the, all, since I was a little kid, because I used to have a crush on other kids at kindergarten. Like, uh, well, for me, I mean, when I was small, I knew there was something uh, different about me. Um, I knew I wanted to, to be like my sisters. Um, I didn't know what it was or what it was called because nobody, <laughs> nobody knew that back then. So um, I knew from a young age I was different. I didn't know exactly why, and I couldn't put it into words. So I didn't really know I was gay. All I knew was that I didn't have the attraction to men that my female friends did. And, or it was a different kind of attraction. They were like buddies, pals. I loved them, like with every fiber of my body. They were more my friends than my girlfriends were because I couldn't relate to what the girls were talking about. They are talking about, oh, he's so cute and he's all this, and it just wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess when I first realized that I was attracted to both men and women would be after puberty, um, around seventh, uh, around seventh grade. Um, but before that, uh, when I was really little, I know I, I had this interest with uh, the GI Joe dolls. Uh, I had um, I played with the GI Joe toys, and I was I had this interest in the physique of of the male dolls. Uh, at the time, I didn't know I was queer yet, but uh, that's how far back it goes. Well, I knew from the day I was born I was different. I also knew that people didn't want to talk about it. So I knew I had a secret. I remember one of the very first memories is watching some TV show with my brother. He was excited about Net or Bray. And I looked at him and I was like, okay, cool. I like Toby Tyler. Oh, that is really hard. Because I was 21, 22. I never knew anything when I was young. And, uh, and I met this woman and got involved, and, and I was like surprised. I'm like, what is this? I, I was not even clear what it was, but I started the relationship with her, and then I moved to Louisiana, so I didn't have to deal with anything to acknowledge to anybody. I was by myself over there, and she moved there with me. So that was my first experience. That's when I realized, oh, I am here. Uh, for me, I was a tad oblivious. Uh, I never quote, realized I was gay. I just realized I was head over heels in love with a friend. Uh, about the time I was uh, 14, and the realizing the gay part came as the, oh, that friend happened to be a guy, what did that mean? Um, the hardest part about growing up gay, at least once I became aware of it, was I didn't have anybody to talk to. There was nobody that I knew of who was gay. Um, being a first-generation American, my parents were born, both born and raised in Mexico. I, that wasn't an option. Um, my brother, my sister, no. I didn't know anyone. And I just, I struggled with it. You know, I just, I didn't know who to talk about it with. And so I just kind of kept it all to myself. And even then I was concerned because I thought, is this really what's going on <laughs> with me? I wasn't sure. You know, there was a lot of confusion because sometimes I saw some men and I thought, oh, they're cute. And then I saw some women, I go, they're really cute. And so there was this kind of confusion in my mind, but just not being able to have someone to be honest with and have those conversations, that was the most difficult part for me. Well, it's dealing with the shame. I knew if I came out, I would be shamed. But seeing everybody's shame, everybody else, how are they doing that? They're going to, sit, they're going to hell, abominations, all those words that, that, that just seem like they're just words, but they are hurtful words. So many times our society has hurtful words that we use that don't have any love attached to them. Um, I ended up getting married because I thought that is what I was supposed to do. I met the most beautiful girl in college that all the guys wanted and she liked me and next thing you know, I'm driving to San Jose and marrying Kathleen. But because of that, I, we had a life, a long life. My longest relationship yet was to my ex-wife. Out of all the gay relationships, it's still to my ex-wife. Because it was defined. 
men were men, women were women. They had roles to play. It was all defined. It was all nice and nice and clear. Um, but because of that I have a son. He's Matthew. He's in the Air Force now. He's 36. He's stationed in uh, Germany right now, enjoying life. I came out to him in the 90s when I, my ex-wife and I got a divorce. We had joint custody, so I would have him on the weekends, and there's a couple times I'd go on a date, and I would take him to my mom and dad's house so she, he'd baby, they'd babysit him. But I'll never forget one time, Matt was sitting in the car seat in the back. He looked at me and he said, my daddy Steve, he sits there, my mommy sits here. So he looked at my date and said, are you gonna be my mommy? I just like, you know, out, out of the mouth of babes, honesty and truthful, just trying to make sense of everything. And that has been a life lesson to me. Just make sense of it. Love the life we have. Um, well, just sort of that, knowing I was, knowing I was different. And all I knew, I grew up in the 1970s. I graduated from high school in 1982. And all I knew is that people that were different were a target. And so, I didn't want to be a target, so I, I did my best to blend in to the point of, of really practically being invisible. So the hardest part of growing up for me was not being able to share who I was with, with anybody. The fact that you cannot be yourself, the fact that you have to hide these feelings and these emotions and act like if you're not yourself, but sometimes I just didn't care and that's what the, the hardest part was, like uh, bullying, for example, at school, especially when you're, when you're small. And... Mm, for me, was um, once I went back to Puerto Rico, was to acknowledge my friends, my family, you know, because when I was in Louisiana, I didn't have to deal with anything. So that was the hardest part for me. Um, I did not tell a lot of my friends. I didn't even tell my parents. My brother did. And they accepted fine, so there was not any issue. But for me, that was the hardest, was to acknowledge to let my other family and friends know. Tell them I confessed you know, what was going on with me and that I was transitioning. Um, first thing, my dad went and he found his Bible and went rummaging <laughs> through it. Um, my mom tried to convince me that I didn't know my own mind. Uh, they were staunchly against, against it, said that I'm going to hell, that I was an abomination. My father said I was an abomination unto God. Um, I think he was looking for somewhere in the Bible where it said that, but couldn't seem to find it. Uh, honestly, it was the growing up in Orange County, you know, not being able to acknowledge that part of who I was. Uh, went off to college and deliberately chose some place that was far away, thinking at the time that I needed to, to be able to be out. Uh, came out to my dad when I was in college, and that was a little rocky. Uh, in retrospect, it turned out in part that was a misunderstanding. He had said something and I had heard one thing when he had meant another, but it took us a couple of years to really get back the relationship that we had had before that. And that was, that was pretty rough. So it wasn't until I took this course that I realized that Jesus is, this is, this is he's the guy who came here. He's the one who made the world better. And so when I came to terms with that during CR, during Celebrate Recovery, you can talk to me about Jesus all you want, and I'm very thankful, you know, to have that um, resolved in my life, because until then, it wasn't. So I'm, I'm really thankful. And being here and just engaging in this community, in this congregation, it's just fulfilled so many holes that were lacking in my life. It's just been a really positive experience for me, but I've never felt that I was rejected, you know, um, by, 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 by Christianity because I wasn't engaged in it, you know? And I, I, another friend in CR who is a Catholic says, well, why don't you come back? And I said, no, the, the, the Pope throws us a bone. But here, I don't feel that. Here, there's an acceptance, and that's why I'm here. Well, to me, the very simple answer is God is love, and God loves us all unconditionally. And when we first came to IECC, we were looking for a church where we could feel accepted and okay. And I think I cried through the whole first service because it was just so, such a relief. And um, been there ever since. Yes, we looked, we went to several churches and as soon as they started talking about being gay was a sin, we wouldn't go back there anymore. So when we came to IECC, everyone was so friendly. Um, 
and I remember specifically Deborah Banwell was yeah. just marvelous, uh, very friendly, outgoing, and welcoming, and several other people. And so, yeah, it was. We've been, you know, we stayed ever since. So Patty said, uh, "I said, should we go back next week?" She said, "Well, if I have to cry every time, I don't know if I want to go back." <laughs> but it's not okay. <laughs> but it's okay to cry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I. I've been in Irvine since 2006, and I would drive around Alton, and I would see IUCC with the big comma and the rainbow flags. So I would get into uh, the, uh, the um, do a Google search about IUCC, and when I would read, this is about open and affirming church, I didn't believe it. And so I always hesitated to come to church. When I finally decided to join the church, I was impressed by the fact that they are welcoming and accepting of gay people. Um, the question of reconciling God with my faith and everything is really hard because you hear the church, not just in general, the Christian church, condemning uh, homosexuality. And so you kind of question, why is that? And you think, why would I join a Christian church if generally they condemn gay people? But I believe that the relationship between God and you is personal. And that God, I know God loves us all the same. And there's no church that's gonna tell me that I cannot join them. I wanna know, could God be accepting of people like me, people like so many of us who are LCBT? And, you know, then I was Googling and, you know, I stumbled upon like progressive Christianity, what that was and like different like denominations that believed in it. And through the online service, I discovered IUCC. And like then I remember I had a one on one tour with Pastor Sarah. And I remember right then and there, I was awestruck. I was amazed. And I knew right then and there, God had brought me to IUCC. And, and I always knew that God accepted every, everything. I never had any doubt exactly. about that because that's how my dad taught me about God, and so I never had any problems with that. Love That's you. what I learned in, when I was going to school, as you know, Catholic school, in my really early years, was uh, accepting God, and he's not hateful. It's he's a loving love. God. It's about love. And so being gay was part of loving God. So it, it really didn't enter into anything. Um, uh, I didn't, the Catholic Church later came out with uh, totally against gay. My sister, on the other hand, is gay, but she's also a nun. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it's a little little wonky here and there, but yeah, I, I have no problem really. The special experiences to me was the first week I transitioned at work. Um, I have a good friend there, and, and she, you know, we'd go on walks together, we'd talk, and but she's very blunt, so. so Every day it was like, Christine, you know, your hair's wrong, your makeup's wrong, your, your, this is wrong, your that's wrong. So by the end of the week, I was, I was still happy I, I did it and excited, but also kind of like tired and like, oh my God, I got so much to learn. How am I ever going to learn everything I have to do? And another one of my coworkers came by and I thought, oh, she's going to tell me yet again, Christine, you need to do this, you need to do that. And she walked up to me and she said, Christine, you're beautiful. And I said, Oh no, I have to do my hair. And she stopped me. She said, Christine, you're beautiful. And then I made some excuse about this and that. And she stopped me probably three times. And she made me acknowledge that I was beautiful. And she didn't have to do that. And um, I was very thankful that she took the time to do that. The whole incident was like two minutes long, maybe, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. Well, the 80s were hard because a lot of my men friends got sick and the, one of my friends died of AIDS. And I remember being told to be, to not tell anybody what he died from. People came over to my, men came over to our house and said, you know, if anybody asked you, tell them Bob died of pneumonia. Remember, it was called GRID back then. It wasn't called AIDS. It's called GRID, gay-related immune disease. So it was, back then, it was seen as something that only happened to gay men, because we weren't told that people in Africa were dying of AIDS or other countries. We were told it was because gay men did what they did. 
and we didn't know anything until the scientists finally enlightened us. But back in the early 80s, when my friends started to get sick or die, my longest time friend died of AIDS. We were friends since we were in the, in the nursery in Sunday school. <laughs> and he was one of those, he was a, an unusual gay man because he never cheated on any of his partners. <laughs> but he caught in between a relationship. He got AIDS. And he couldn't believe it because he had never been one of those people. He wasn't the promiscuous. So he thought he was going to be fine. So he went to the hospital then with his symptoms and even then didn't think it was AIDS because he had been such a good boy. It was hard. I mean, the, our when wedding we, day. Yeah, I was going to say, when we were able to say I do, that mm -hmm. uh, people often ask me, did you feel different? I said, actually, I did. I can't even explain why, but it was, it was. I think for, I mean, magical. with that, it was magical because we're standing up in front of a group of people who accept us for who we were and was celebrating our love for each other and our commitment to each other. And something that we, as I said earlier, never thought I would ever have that opportunity as a, I didn't even as a guy. I mean, we talked about having a commitment ceremony right. and trying to make it official, but when it was more official, yeah. in fact, before we got married, David and then Michael made, they got married officially in their house in Irvine and we Here's were their right. best men. Yeah. And I literally, when I went to sign the form, you know, as a witness, my hand was shaking and I just, the realization hit me like, I'm actually signing a, a legal document to state that these two people I care about and my, are good friends of ours are solidifying their marriage in document in legal form. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was powerful. Hmm. <laughs> well, just, we could have it, you know, yeah. and, and that it would be recognized federally. I mean, we were so ex excited when Doma overturned that we called Paul and I said, how is your schedule? For, he says, come now to the courthouse. I said, well, not today. I can marry you in the courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> but the other exciting thing was when we announced to the congregation that we were going to get married and that we were, they were all invited. They cheered and clapped and it was, yeah. it was an astounding experience. And then they all came to the wedding. <laughs> so that was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. It was so hard for me to have to cut any of that. I know we're running late. One quick more, one quick story and then we'll be done. I came out to my family when I was 21 years old. Um, I was home from college uh, my junior year. I was uh, from o Oklahoma, but I was in college in Jersey. And I had tried for several years to tell my parents when I would come home at Christmas, but I could never quite work up the courage. But this particular year, um, I knew I had to do it. There was no way around it. Um, but I waited until the night before I was to fly home, and it was midnight, and my parents were asleep. So I walked down this really long hallway we had, and uh, with wood floors, you could hear the sounds, uh, the floor squeaking, and I knocked on the door, and I opened it up, and their lights were off. My dad was snoring. And I woke my mom up first, and I said, Mom, I need to, I need to tell you guys something. And uh, so then she woke up my father, and uh, I still remember him. He's like, oh, what, huh? <laughs> Craig needs to tell us something. And then they turned on the lights, and they were both there, you know, lying in their bed. And I immediately just began to weep and began to cry because... Um, I was scared and worried and do they still love me and dealing with shame and without a thought, without a second, all I remember is that both of them got out of their bed, walked around, put their arms around me and hugged me and said, it's okay, it's okay. And it's never been an issue with my family, I'm so blessed for that. In no world that I can imagine is the reaction of the God Almighty any different than what my parents showed me that night. God loves you. Jesus loves you. IUCC loves you. 
You are the pot of gold at the end of every rainbow, and somewhere over that rainbow, God in us and through us and with us is transforming this world into a place where every Sunday is Pride Sunday for the lovers, the dreamers, the believers, and me. That is our Sunday message. Amen.